first off, welcome to uh, welcome to the podcast, Mr. East Forest. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And uh, as I was preparing for this, and, and as I imagine I will uh, prepare for the intro uh, and introducing you, which I'll, I won't do on this call, but I'll do after, I, I was trying to think of how to describe your music. And like, I'm a big fan of ambient music. Um, I'm a big fan of a lot of Indian classical music. And in particular, you knew, your new album with Ramdas, you know, it kind of spans a lot of genres. But I was curious to ask you, how, how would you describe uh, the sound of East Forest? How would you describe your music? Yeah, I, I should probably have a better elevator pitch for that because obviously I, I do get asked that a lot. Um, and it is a bit wide in its, music, in its musical nomenclature. So essentially, I think the thing that ties it together is it's music that is inviting introspection. It's just music that pushes you inside in general. But musically, it's electroacoustic. So it's a mixture of acoustic and electronic it's largely instrumental, but there are vocals. Uh, it mixes in field recordings. So some people call it ambient, but it's not really completely ambient music. And some people call it like electronic, but it's not really just electronic music at all. I see most of the stuff on the Ramdas record is acoustic, like real instruments that are recorded, except for the drum programming. Um, so I often, you know, have had lots of different phrases, like anything from electroacoustic orchestral pop people have called it like um electronic orchestral shaman rock uh, people have you know all sorts of things so it doesn't i mean kind of it's a long like i said it's always a long-winded answer and that's like the artist's worst fate it's when they can't just say what it is but um it often gets classified in the ambient category or it's it's definitely very chill or relaxing, so to speak. So it often gets put in that category. I like shaman rock. I think you should go with that. That's great. <laughs> I've heard that before. Yeah. Um, so rock how... and roll definitely is what it is. But, yeah, it's um, not rock, it's but yeah. More fun to say that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So tell me how you got started in music and how particularly did the East Forest project begin? Well, it started 10 years ago, um, this particular project, I was in my late 20s having some, a lot of personal spiritual growth and revelations through plant medicine work, particularly with psilocybin, otherwise known as magic mushrooms. And I'd had some powerful experiences with music and the, uh, that particular medicine. And I think I was trying to make music for myself that I could use in introspective states to explore that inner space to kind of reconnect with certain places and states I had experienced really accidentally before these deep meditative states and I wanted to go back there because it was returning to something something universal something that I felt like was a core element about like what it means to be alive and be human and something I was longing for and I just felt that music could be a tool to get there. And I didn't, there wasn't any like music out there that just was explicitly for that or that I really resonated with personally. And so it was a quite, sort of a perfect storm of things in my life changing and transforming and fall, falling apart that in essence kind of forced me to try something different, but also was setting the stage to be curious and have, have the interest and time to do that. So I didn't have any agenda when I was making the music to make it into a new career or something to sell or let alone perform. Um, but I was just following my own bliss in the words of Joseph Campbell. And that really turned out to be something special. And I remember after about a year, I had uh, my first record, which I still wasn't planning on knowing what to do with, but I used it. I used it for myself. I had this really profound experience, and I, and then some of my friends did, and then they started organizing shamanic circles for me to work with. And then I remember when I was I was in a band before. It was a pretty mainstream kind of project, and I was really you know gun ho about it and pushing, pushing, pushing. It just wasn't really going anywhere. And my bass player, his name was John. He heard this new stuff I was doing, and he even even though he was in my band, he's like. You should never stop doing that. I want to like quit this band and do that. <laughs> and wow. so there were some wonderful signs from the universe about that. It felt more authentic. 
and it felt more like I was really starting to get into something that was my own voice and more sort of my lane. But it took a long, long time, many years for that to develop into something that was public and something that became what it is today. I mean, it took, here it is 10 years later. So it was a long, slow process, very organic. Have you, uh, well, I was going to ask you about um, different perhaps spiritual paths you've been down or different teachers you've been interested in or whatever, but just going back to the beginnings of this project and your early um, spiritual explorations, I mean, have you always been interested in spirituality? And if so, were there any particular traditions you were interested in or that you, any paths you went down in particular that you found really made a difference or, or what? Well, my memory of growing up was more that I was just precocious and sort of a class clown and always wanting to forge my own way, probably to the annoyance of my friends and teachers and parents. Uh, but I've had, I had, I was just talking to a friend uh, the other day, Christian, on my own podcast, and I hadn't talked to him in a long time. And we knew each other, he, he knew me back when I was in my very young 20s, when I first moved to New York City around this time, where I was starting to go through some of this stuff. And he said, oh, you're always very philosophical. And that's sort of his way of saying spiritual and my memory is not that and i'm like oh that's interesting because i i always think of myself sort of like before and after in a way there was before i had a very profound experience with you know that first record and mushrooms and like i remember the day and the time and it was like there was before that and after that as a linchpin in my life but nonetheless i think i always had a curiosity i know i always had issues with depression i still do but back then it was quite acute and I think that was sort of me yearning for something more and not having any way to find it. There was no, you know, my, and my family was not religious. It's more atheist, agnostic, kind of classical suburban America, sort of adrift. And that never felt right to me. Even as a kid, even when I was like in first grade, you know, I walked out of the first day of school because I said, this isn't for me. I was like, fuck this. Like, uh, I see. A, I saw a bunch of desks and someone telling you what to do, and I was like, "This is this is horrible." And so I just left. And I've I have always had those feelings, even as a kid. So, um, I was definitely hungry. I just didn't have any teachers. And as I got older, I did try things, you know, that was available to me, like Christianity. And when I got to colleges, I, I smattered around with Buddhism and really whatever was there, you know, every white kid who tries to be a Rastafarian is like, oh, it's maybe it's about marijuana and maybe it's about the hippies. Maybe it's about this. And there are lots of things in a lot of those different um, worlds that helped me and I picked up on are still part of my life and that have led me to where I am. But I think nothing really cracked me open until uh, psychedelics. And I don't they weren't like, I wasn't like, that was my thing. You know, I just had a few experiences. And the first one was actually in college. And thank God it was positive, accidentally, really. But it was the first time that it was no longer just like ideas or a book. It was a felt experience. And it was so profound and strong and indescribable uh, that I couldn't argue with it. But I also didn't understand it. Not that you ever understand it, quote unquote. But it was enough to light a fire in me to say, okay, there's definitely something more. I knew it. Um, what is this? And then here we all are on our paths to sort of explore that mystery. And I think that's what my music became is a way to explore and honor the mystery and to dance with it and to uh, lie in it and to rest into it. And I just found like a lot of us have found through the wisdom traditions that the way we get in touch with the mystery is often through stillness, through introspection, and that the answers come from within. Uh, and so I've just been more in relationship with that. And my music has become more of a practice and a path for me, sort of my own religion in a sense, because those other things left me feeling empty and I needed to find something that had meaning and that worked for me. And so the music became a bit of a tool. I feel very blessed that then it could become a job in a sense, because then it gives me the opportunity to do it uh, more. It actually motivates me, you know, when I have, you have, you really have to do it to keep your life going. 
And the fact that other people then can somehow interface with this thing that's valuable to me and it, we become in a relationship uh, is nothing short of incredible because I kind of do it because I have to, but I'm not sure I would have the full motivation to do it if it wasn't in relationship with others. Hmm. I'm going to preface this next question by telling you that I don't have any experience with psychedelics. Uh, I'm a longtime meditator and I've, I think I've entered some fairly psychedelic states, um, but it's all been au naturel, at least, at least for me. Um, so I don't exactly have access to the experiences you're describing. And you mentioned that they're indescribable, at least your, your early experiences with, uh, with psychedelics. I'm going to ask you to try and describe it. Like what, what did you see? What did you experience? And what piqued your curiosity and motivated you to continue down that path? Well, it is, I mean, my attempts to describe it will be pithy, but I can try. I, I mean, there's been more than one, but I remember the first one that I referenced when I was 20, I was 20 and I was in college and I'd heard about mushrooms, obviously, as most college kids have. And we got some and I had tried some before this, this, my friend Clint and like, I, I think I didn't take enough and nothing really happened. So I was like, hmm, that was kind of a wash. And then there was this big party at school. I went to Vassar College, which is a college in the Northeast. And there's a party every May called Founders Day. It's like the founder, Matthew Vassar's birthday. And so it's this big outdoor party. And it's when the cherry blossoms are in bloom and it's outdoors. It's really lovely. And we got mushrooms. So I thought I should take more. And I took, I think it was about an eighth of them. And of course, that, that came on. <laughs> it was my first experience. And so at first, when you're on a psychedelics, usually it's uncomfortable and you're kind of going through the early stages, which is sort of just, you're still in reality, but things are getting strange and you're laughing, you're talking to people and it's just, things are weird. And, and I was just doing that. I remember I was just on the hillside talking to people. It was really fun. But then it kept progressing and it got very strange. And, you know, reality started to break down, like time, and I couldn't quite follow things. And somehow I had the wherewithal to go off, off the hill where everybody was and over to these cherry trees and lie on the grass. And I remember, to this day, I remember lying there and watching the cherry blossoms fall down on my face in this indescribable beauty. And I essentially was giving myself space for stillness and quiet. This is how this medicine, and same thing with meditation, how it speaks to you, you have to give it the space and cultivate it. And so I was over there just getting, letting myself go inside. And I probably remember closed my eyes and the medicine just started to increase and increase. And then everything started to break down. Like, who, who am I? Like, what is, what is my senses of individual and time broke down. And I just started to get into that sense of union and oneness with all that is. And instead of it being scary, thankfully, it was very positive and, and profound. I mean, deeply, deeply profound. And I remember coming out of that and feeling like everyone needs to experience this. Like my parents need to experience classic 20 year old kid, you know, the whole world needs to experience this. Um, but I also didn't know what it was. Like, what was that? And what the hell? Like now I'm, it just was, I didn't know anything. I had no teachers. I didn't know anything. Um, so it, it, it's a way of having a felt experience that you can't argue with. It was no longer an idea. It was a felt experience. It wasn't even like a dream. Like I remember it to this day, at least what I felt like and some of the imagery, but it's not even about the imagery. It was about the, the ineffable thing is that when it transcends yourself and time, it's also transcending language. And so the feelings I felt when I say connected or I felt oneness, don't even do justice to the, the, the fullness of that feeling of oneness. And I'm absolutely confident you've felt these things and everyone has felt these things. It's just whether they give credence to it and really it's enough with your physiology and personality to be a profound experience. It absolutely may be. For me, I was just a very tough nut to crack. And so I needed that kind of really, really profoundly strong hit that maybe lasted an hour or so to be like, holy shit, there's, oh my, like, I, you can't argue with that because it's like you just went to the center of the universe and back, <laughs> maybe, maybe literally. Um, and so that's what I like about music again and art and creativity is that it's, I feel like all the whole point of most art is to try and 
dance and paint and, and describe these things because only art can do that because these things, it just, just the list of words of description would really not do any justice, but a poem would do better justice because it's metaphor in a sense, or a song because those core, especially instrumental music, I like instrumental music a lot because now you don't even have words. It's just engendering feeling in you. And at the end of the day, that's all we're doing is, is sort of, uh, you know, art and music is this giant celebration of, of, things that we cannot be spoken to hmm. that's well put and when you when you describe those experiences with with uh with mushrooms that one one experience i mean i've yeah i mean i think i've told the story in my podcast about um a very very similar experience i had in the midst of a you know a lengthy meditation retreat once and it's you described my experience pretty pretty closely it's so i, I guess i can relate more than i more than i realize I think there are infinite doorways into the mystery that has no edge. Yeah. And um, that was just my doorway. And that's why it's not a panacea or a tool for everyone. Psychedelics, it's just that is a tool out there. And some people, that's they're what they need. And some people, like for you, what you're doing. And some people, it's, a, it's something else. Hmm. Absolutely. I, I, one thing, I mean, I've, so I, I you know, I did a lot of uh, freelance music journalism for many years and I've spoken to a lot of musicians and one thing I find interesting about the way you are speaking now and in other interviews and clips I've read maybe I'm misreading this but it seems to me that that you create music with often a specific intention or you're trying to elicit certain feelings in your audience you're trying to get them to have a certain experience not that you're putting up walls or, or you're really trying to strictly define it, but it, I find it interesting that it seems like there's real intention behind a lot of your music, whereas a lot of other artists, you know, they, they'll frame it in terms of, well, this is just my self-expression and people can do with it whatever they want. If they like it, that's great. If they don't, that's cool too. Um, but w what about you? I mean, how, how do you respond to what I just said? Is that accurate? Like, do you, is there a real intention behind your music or does it change from project to project? But like I, I think I referenced that earlier. I do think there is an intention. And I, I do notice that most sort of traditional artists are more um, in that camp that you're speaking to where they're like, nope, you know, this is just me doing what I do. I'm not intending you to have any experience other than what you have. And, um, and I'm not sure. Sometimes I think it's, it's to my own... Uh, like it doesn't serve my project for me to always be saying like, oh, you know, this music is, is to go inside and because that's what it is for me as opposed to me just doing it and not defining it that way. And I think for a lot of traditional music journalists or, you know, critiques and stuff, for some reason that really triggers them or it just then they, they, start, they start categorizing my music in a way that diminishes it. Like they like, oh, it's, it's like self-help or it's yoga or it's new age or this. And like, it's really, it's no different than any other music, like contemporary classical music or electronic music or anything else. It's just emotional, I guess. I mean, maybe that's like when I'm trying to describe my music, I'm working too hard. Maybe I'm just like, oh, it's emotional, electroacoustic, you know, largely instrumental music. <laughs> hmm. That just feels very cold, but it doesn't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think most artists are always looking for more respect in a way. I feel like Rodney Dangerfield, but I, I do, I sometimes feel that it doesn't get the respect unless the person who's trying to quantify it opens their heart a little bit. It's like anytime they try to just be through straight rock criticism, there's this snarkiness to it. Hmm. We're sort of like, oh, he's trying to get you to feel good or he's trying to get you to go inside or whatever it is. And um, somehow that like now is a therefore it's not that good, you know, therefore hmm. it can't stand on its own. I mean, it's I don't know why I think it's sort of like there's a there's a large mainstream snarkiness that you see it. That's the story that we all agree to. It's on NPR. It's sort of uh, it's sort of the classic liberal press, um, and I'm a progressive, but I mean I see it. I know what like the right wing is so pissed off about because there is that sort of elitist uh, attitude of like, well, there is there is this sort of we've we've created 
the echelon of what is good and right. And there's a coldness to it. It's, you see it in the New York Times. It's sort of like, no, this is what, what criticism should be. And on some levels, it is devoid of the heart. That being said, the other end of the spectrum is absolutely horrible. Like, you know, your, your sloppy, saccharine, new age dolphins and all the stuff. I mean, that's what people are reacting against. And that is sloppy and lazy. Absolutely. Uh, and so I am trying to do a dance where I am saying, you know what? I just want to be authentic and I want to be a vanguard to say it's okay to speak to some of the things I'm speaking to. And I work really hard to do it in a way that is something you can't argue with or I'm not using any terms that really don't mean anything, you know, sort of new age terms, mm. using words uh, that are universal because I want to speak to a universal experience. And at the end of the day, I just want to reach as many people, such as yourself, as you said before we started, this, that the music kind of helps them out. Great. Uh, if, if, if you enjoy it and it's not giving you an emotional kick, I don't, that's great too. I really have no a horse in that game. But I, I just want to like offer a tool for the world. It's very intentional for me on a personal level that I want to feel like I have a purpose right now in this crazy transition we're going through as a planet. I don't want to feel like I'm adding to the problem by distracting people. I don't think that's useful. And so it's like, well, if I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to make music and spend all my time doing that. I don't want to be dying on my deathbed and think I was just wasting my time trying to make money and just putting schlock out that'll be forgotten in a week, a month, a year, whatever. I want to create something that's timeless, that's useful, that's as powerful as I can possibly make it, and that's beautiful. That's it. And I want to make, that's what I consider to be great art. And it doesn't mean you can't make great art that's like cold and maybe explores the darkness or explores the nothingness. Those are useful, needed colors in the tapestry of creativity in the world. I just have particular gifts that I want to share, and so I, that's what I do. Yeah, that's that's well put and kudos to you for just owning that and putting it out there. Um, Cause I agree. There's a kind of liberal snark that accompanies a lot of these discussions and um, yeah, even the term new age. I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot of garbage in, in that, uh, in that genre, but yeah, I, 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 I um, I've had similar responses to some of the, the pieces I've read and I think I know, I think I know where you're coming from. You yeah, mentioned pitchfork yeah. would probably, you know, have a hate, <laughs> With the record, which I would invite in a lot of ways, make go for it, but yeah. or the New York Times, or um, I mean, NPR has been kind of friendly to me, but uh, it just keeps it has to be like an open mindedness, I think, is all it requires, and that's yeah. not really a bad quality for us to have in a lot of situations, right? With just this idea of polarization that's going on, that's increasing, we need a little bit more of like, okay. Before I'll just do the label last, not the label first. And mm. like we're we're working hard to see if we can get the Ram Dass record and Ram Dass a Grammy and a nomination. And their only category it fits in, obviously, is a New Age category. But that's because there is no other category. <laughs> it's only like right. closest is world, what's clearly not world. And then we get into rock, country, classical, pop. Yeah, it, that's what it is. I mean, I don't know what to say. It's like you just try to work within the systems that you have. Um, but as as you said too at the beginning, like the mu the music on the record goes a lot of places, for better or worse, and we have a hip hop track on there, and we have an ambient track, and we have um, contemporary classical tracks on there, uh, and that's just because I like lots of different kinds of music. I that's just that's just what comes out of me. I was just trying to serve what Ram Dass said, and essentially like write little film scores to each subject that he was talking about, and that to me is like, well, this this is what I think. Would, would help that. And I wasn't trying to like put a filter on it and stop myself and be like, Oh, I can't do anything with a kind of a hip hop gorillas beat. That would be, you know, that's mm. you know, pushing some boundary. I don't want to do. I think you succeeded in that. And actually when you mentioned the, the film scores for each, each piece, I mean, that really is kind of what it feels like. It kind of feels like, you know, you know, the Jarmusch film coffee and cigarettes or something like that, where it's like a collection of like short films, something like that. Um, so I think you succeeded there. I, 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 I want to get deeper into the Ramdas project very, very soon. But before, uh, 
we talk about that. You mentioned earlier that, you know, this is your purpose and you seem fairly clear about that. I'm always interested to talk to people like you or any kind of artists or creative people. Do you feel really clear about your purpose? And what is your approach to sort of goal setting, um, planning for the future? Um, like, are you really clear? Do you set clearly, you know, definable goals or are you kind of more free flowing or, or what? How do you think about that? Sort of at both end. Uh, I, I do feel clear on my purpose, but I don't feel clear all the time. Like anybody, I have doubts and I have days where I feel really down. And I, my biggest worry is what I spoke to earlier is that I'm causing just, I'm not helping. And that I'm actually like lost in my own delusion and that I'm lying to myself. These are the things, the critic in my head. It's like, yeah, you think you're doing X, Y, Z, but it's really not. And you're really just trying to make money and trying to get famous. And this is all a total waste. And you're just like everybody else trying to blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's my worst day. And my best day is, oh, this isn't about me. I'm a go-between for something larger. My job is to just do good work and, and have discipline. And this is really important. And what I have to say is unique to me and has nothing to do with anybody else. And there's no point in comparing because what you're doing is singular and you just do your thing. You put it out there and the universe is perfect. And that's my best mm. day. Uh, and I'm always dancing like anybody. All right, we're in these space suits as human bodies and you kind of go up and you go down and it's always flowing throughout the day. So I've, I've noticed as I get older that creative practice um, has a plays a large role in my mental state. So then it also became just uh, rehearsing or playing or creating is directly connected to how I feel mentally. Now I can't say why that is but I have noticed that very clearly just through my own self-analysis. And so I know that now. And again, that's, it helps me that this is a job because thankfully it helps me then motivate me to do it. And by doing it, I can, I can just feel more purposeful. And so just, just like trying is I try to be happy with the, the labor, not the fruits, mm. so to speak. And recognize that like the other day, <clears throat> um, I went into the studio and was, I had the piano tuned as a way of forcing me to record. And I've been recording and I think it's garbage. Like I have like, I can't come up with anything that's even worth, I can't even get a single thing recorded. That's even a complete idea. And I'm, it's hard, but I am proud that I did it. I'm like, well, that's all you have to do is, is go in there and put in the time and what comes out. I really don't have a lot of control over. And so the way I often work, uh, for, for instance, with the Ram Dass project, I knew I wanted it to be good, I obviously, and it was a big project, but the only way I knew how to, to work on it was in bricks, like small pieces. And, and so every day, you just put in some time. It doesn't have to be a crazy time, but every, you know, pretty much every day. And because I've learned that over time, through doing that, if you look back after a month or two, you're going to have gems in there and things that were right in front of you, but you couldn't see them. They're like, oh, that was a really exy. In the moment, it felt simplistic or not that interesting. But looking back, when I have a different ear listening to it, where I'm no longer, maybe I don't even remember what I was doing. I'm like, oh, that is quite touching. Or there's a simplicity, such a beauty to that simplicity. Wow, that's so beautiful. Um, and there's enough and you'll have days where it's like, nope, that's nothing, that's nothing. But you start to build those bricks and you take the bricks that are more important and you start to build something and then, and then you start to see the holes. Oh, you know, this really you could use this and then I'll start to try to make that. And then you just keep building like that. Uh, so it's a process of, of letting go. And to your question about whether I have, I have goals, sure, yeah, I have milestones and goals. And at the same time, I'm also trying to uh, trust and honor this larger thing that's unfolding. So my, my practice with my career is a spiritual practice because there's not much, there's not much of a veil between my spiritual outlook and process internally and my external life uh, and my conversations and my work and my performance. And that's just how I want it to be personally. I want, if I had a goal, it would be that my day-to-day -day internal monologue 
and that obviously including then the next layer out would be my external monologue that I and my interaction with the world and the next layer up there would be my career my public persona there's no separation and all I want to cultivate is peace inside myself and I think that's sort of the goal of Buddhism too it's like it's like a way of life it's just like I'm, I'm trying to like anyone I hope what's the way to have right livelihood and feel good inside and feel at peace inside and feel meaningful and that's not about just highs you know it's not just about also the lows it's more about how i can watch that show go by the compassion i have with myself um how i can keep this sort of witness consciousness and see to when all these things inevitably are going to happen inevitably um and just just the other day I was performing and I remember walking back to the hotel room and actually having the thought, I had just watched the Ram Dass film, the new Becoming Nobody, and I was performing at the premiere. And it's first time I'd seen the, the film and it actually inspired me because Ram Dass was talking about these things. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm never going to feel down again. And, or like, cause I'm just going to watch it. Like maybe I just had that feeling of like, it's possible it could be different. And then like a couple days later, something of course happened in my life that got me really upset and I was feeling all of a sudden really down, you know, and all the things started to come in like feelings of panic and had nothing to do with music. It's just, you know, something in my life. And, and I was watching it though. And I could still keep that seat saying, Oh, wow, here's that feeling. Damn. I feel I, there's that panic feeling. There's that feeling of hopelessness. And, and then I eventually started to feel, I don't want to say better, but not as charged. And I still can look back that whole ride. And there, I, I was proud, I guess, that there was a part of me, almost like a, there's a candle flame, I hope, inside of us that we can cultivate. And I think that med meditation does this, where there's a part of you that never gets stinged by those things, that sort of says like, well, no matter what, there's still that. And that is me. And that doesn't change. And wherever I am or whoever I'm with or however I feel, there's still just that essence of me that's fine and that exists. Even if I'm in pain, even if I'm, you know, all these things that can really throw you off your marker, especially physical pain. Um, and I, I try to cultivate that um, and that sense of not knowing. And so because my spiritual life is uh, part of my professional life, I have sort of larger beliefs of trust that it's unfolding as it's supposed to be unfolding and that helps me too so it's not just about me setting a goal and i either fight to get it or i don't i do the work labor but the fruits it's like all right you know i i trust that this is meant to to go this way or that way and such and such opportunity it doesn't mean i sit back and just wait for the phone to ring but it's this interesting dance between the phone ringing and me doing outreach um, but not trying to club things over the head. If, like if something's not working, being like, okay, maybe it's not supposed to work. Um, and that's been a way of taking the pressure relief valve off a little bit off the pressure cooker. It doesn't release all the pressure, but it's enough to say, I'm not trying to control everything and I don't control everything. And I think for a lot of us, that's helpful because we often feel so isolated and individualistic and separate from others in the world. And that feeling is one that creates depression and anxiety and divisiveness. And uh, Ram Dass speaks to this a bit on the record, actually. And really what we need is the opposite. And so uh, we need these, these experiences with meditation or nature or psychedelics or whatever it is for you, service work, that usually starts to break down those feelings where you start to feel more connected. You start to recognize that, oh, when I harm you or the earth, that harms me. And like quite viscerally, when you feel that, not just an idea, um, you start to recognize the golden rule. If I want to feel happy, I, if I make you feel happy, I actually start to feel happy. These things have been told to us for a long time. But, if you want to uh, be loved, give as much life, love as you can, right? Yeah. And we've forgotten a lot of this. It's yeah. right in front of our face. Yeah. But it's just modernity uh, keeps us out of a lot of this, like natural rhythms that have been around us for millennia um now we're out of those and, and we start to feel sick in a sense but we don't yeah. realize like oh just bring those back in instead it's like well maybe there's a new meditation app or you know, like <laughs> I, there's a new watch that can give me some stats on like my keto you know 
<laughs> not that those things are wrong. It's just sort of like, it's sort of band-aids in a way, fingers in a dam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of summing up a lot of what's, uh, what's wrong with the world these days. I really like the way you describe that balance in your approach to work. And uh, have you read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was gonna, I, I was going to say, because a lot of these ideas sound familiar. <laughs> that, that book is so on point. So I've good. given it to a lot of people. Um, the War of Art. Yeah. 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 It's all about that monkey on your back. And once you, I mean, it happened today. I was like, I need to rehearse for a gig I have in Burlington on this weekend. And I was like, oh, I'll do it after this podcast. But and that's resistance right there. I was like, <laughs> resistance right, of the art. yeah, then I just would have been like, now the day has meaning. Yeah. Um, I want to be respectful of your time before I let you go. Um, well, I, I wanted to get more into Ramdas, but I'm having such a good time with, uh, with what we've been talking about. First off, what did you know of Ramdas before this project? Like, was he in your universe at all? And how did this project actually come about, the new record with Ramdas? Yeah, like anybody, I'd read Be Here Now, and it was important to me. And I connected with a lot of Ramdas talks, but that was it. You know, so he's kind of a teacher from afar. And I just had the idea of of working with him and it was just a right timing right place kind of thing but i do remember i was in a meeting with my manager kind of looking at the year and he's he asked me a question about how i'd like my work to be remembered as a way of kind of maybe steering where to go in the future and the way i answered it was that i wanted it to be remembered in the way that ramdas's work is remembered meaning that it's it's timeless feels that it's bigger than just him and his personality and it's serving something larger uh, these sorts of things and i think that inspiration about the quality of his work led me to start thinking like oh it could be interesting to do something with him i didn't know how that would happen uh, so the way it happened was sort of mundane of just actually you know pitching ideas and meeting people but i remember it, there was a spark there almost like an echo from the future uh, and, wow. and there were many steps after that leading up to me essentially sitting across from him in his study in Maui and hitting record that looking back are quite remarkable that they, any of them happen. Uh, and again, it's almost unbelievable where I, I get into that trust again. Of, there must be something larger here that's guiding this because this is beyond just me manhandling my way into a process like that. Well, tell me about that. I mean, going to Hawaii, recording with Ramdas, what, what was that like for you? And did you like, did you ask him questions, specific questions, or did someone else ask him questions? Or what was that process like? I did ask him questions. It was just him and I in his study. And I set up a really nice microphone. And uh, he, he was looking out at the ocean, the North Shore in Hawaii. And the windows were open. And it was a really warm, it was hot. There was a warm breeze coming in. And birds chirping and he we met a couple days on a, a couple different sessions and i just had a lot of patience with him with his aphasia to ask a question and give him a long time to explore it and answer it and then i took out a lot of those pauses in the actual music or used them to my advantage where he says something the music has a phrase and he says something else so now the pause has become an advantage actually he comes alive inside the music because your brain doesn't hear them. You're just hearing the content of what he's saying. Um, and so it was, it was very profound. It's very humbling, very, very humbling and amazing. And he's such a lovely person. He gives you his total attention and he gives you total love. And so that's just a really awesome thing to be around. And it was, it was just really beautiful. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cherish it forever, the time he and I spent together. And I recognize once I got there in that room and the door shut that, you know, being alone with him is rare. It's sort of like the spiritual White House. And somehow <laughs> I made my way into it. And that's when it really hit me is like, oh, this is a, this is a big deal. And I, this is not just me tricking my way in here. This is being guided by something bigger. Um, I know that sounds very religious, just how you want to look at it. You know, for me, it was more like Maharaji, Inkarli Baba, Ma, uh, Ramdas' teacher, sort of allowing this all to happen and, and ma helping make it happen. Like saying, I want this to happen. So here it is happening. And we're each just playing our role. So I think we just need to be open to that in our lives. Just to listening to, 
again, Joseph Campbell, I think, spoke to the same thing in different language. By following your bliss, you're honoring the universe because that's how the universe is speaking to you to try to push you in different directions sometimes. Mm. The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell. We're recommending a lot of good books in this podcast. I like it. Um, yeah. So just, and just briefly, just because I'm, I'm curious about this, like the, the actual musical accompaniment to, um, you know, everything Ram Dass was saying, how did that work? Did like he, would he speak certain sentences or would there be certain passages that really jumped out to you? Then you bring them home, then you compose music around that or, or what was that process like? Well, what he said, I didn't actually have to change much at all. For instance, the first song on the record is called Nature. And I asked him a question, of, I think it was the first question I asked him. And it was about how people feel quite separate and how that's a problem and it's really tough and how nature can be an anecdote to that and uh, antidote. And so particularly with young people, like, what do you have to say about that? How can we use nature? And like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I would wait. And what he said is exactly what you hear on the record. Mm. I mean, that's exactly what he said in the order he said it, you know, trees, uh, water, you know, ocean. Um, and I didn't know where he was going with it. But, you know, after I put it together and took out the pauses in essence, it might have taken him 15 minutes to say what truncated down to one minute. Hmm. It was so profound and beautiful and perfect what he was saying. And I realized that he has 50 years of experience being a public speaker and speaking about these things. He's a complete master and he's fully as fully at his power is just sort of locked behind this aphasia and i just was stunned i was stunned at what a master he was so it was a real gift for me because when i came back to the studio i had like for instance that nature content it was one minute which is great because it's not too long it's enough for a song but not too much and i guess he knew this so I didn't have to cut anything. And mm. so every he is 95% of what he said is what you hear on the record. And I only got enough for a record's worth in our meetings. And I might've had gotten nothing. I mean, I thought going out there, I might get nothing and I'd have to use old Ram Dass talks. Mm. But of course, as it would have it, I got exactly enough, literally exactly enough, 14 songs, 14 little ideas, 14 micro teachings. And wow. I didn't have to cut anything. I didn't rearrange anything that he said. I just cut out little things that might help uh, with clarity or if you stumble on a word, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I just uh, tried to come up with music for each one that I, you know, from scratch that would work, that would work to support what he was saying. He was, he's the main focus of the record and these ideas. And so I just wanted to amplify what he's saying. And that's cool about music just like a film score is it does just that it amplifies the emotional character and quality of it. So I think it took something that was already very powerful on its own, like the nature uh, track. And then it just kind of made it times four as far as its impact with you emotionally when you listen to it. And that's the mechanism of music. And that's what thankfully became, I thought a really successful collaboration because of that, but it was a risk. I didn't know. I didn't know what we would have. I didn't know if it even work against my music, but I had an intuition that it would, yeah, and that um, it would serve his stuff and hopefully connect it to people who have never heard about him. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you certainly accomplished that and then some, so I, I really honor you and, and thank you for this project. It's, uh, as I mentioned, it's helping me get through a bit of a rough time. So I'm particularly appreciative uh, of it. Before I let you go, um, what's the best place people can find you on the web? I'm all you know, I'm on all the social media platforms as either East Forest or East Forest Music. Um, but if you wanted to kind of find a central hub about you know events and like vinyl and, and live dates and all about the Ramdas record and videos, you can always just go to my website, which is just eastforest but dot org, eastforest.org. Well, East Forest, I really want to thank you for your time. Thanks for the record. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for spending this uh, hour with me today. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Humans in Love. If you'd like to learn more about my guests, my work, or you'd like to listen to back episodes of the podcast, please visit humansinlove.com. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Humans in Love 
using your podcast app of choice. If you're a fan of Humans in Love, and you'd like to help keep the show going and help me spread the word, please take 30 seconds out of your day to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. Before I let you go, remember that life is short, so let's make it count. And thank you, as always, for your listenership and support. I'll talk to you again very soon.